I mean, I've tried to interact with some uh, some leading theologians at, at uh, the annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society uh, to, to sit down with them and talk about why this issue matters. Not, not get into the science, not get into the Hebrew, but just theologically, biblically, why does this matter? And I haven't even been able to get them to sit down and discuss that. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Contra Talk. I've got a great conversation, very exciting, very informative, uh, little hot buttony, topicy. I love doing, um, not dancing around issues, but but head, taking head on. So this is a great conversation with uh, Dr. Terry Mortensen. Very generous, humble guy, very knowledgeable, uh, loves the Lord, and just has a lot in store. So enjoy this conversation. It's about just a little over an hour, as you can see. And, uh, you know, maybe break it up or listen to it on, on, on fast or something like that. But listen to the whole thing uh, before you really form an opinion about it. Uh, but please, yeah, comment and, and share it. It's very, very informative. Genesis matters. It really does. Origins matter. Uh, Adam and Eve, the flood, these things matter a lot. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. And, uh, yeah, comment, like, subscribe. You know you know the deal. Okay? All right. Thanks, you All right, morning everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. I've got a guest today, Dr. Terry Mortensen. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, all sorts of fun, interesting, amazing biblical things. Talking about creationism, talking about uh, worldviews, and um, yeah, I've, I've known of Terry and known Terry for a while, uh, Dr. Mortensen, and I'm very thankful that he's on the show. So welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Mortensen. Good to be with you, Richard. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, just kind of briefly, just tell us a bit about yourself, your husband, father, grandfather, or just study school. Yeah, well, I grew up in uh, southern Minnesota, in a small family, and uh, went to the University of Minnesota, where I studied mathematics, and uh, I couldn't solve a calculus problem now if you held a gun to my head. <laughs> um, but I, I, uh, I, I grew up in a church-going family, but I didn't. it wasn't a church where the gospel was clearly proclaimed, and so when I went off to the university, I became a typical college student, partying and that kind of thing. And it was in the end of my freshman year that a Campus Crusade for Christ staff member led me to Christ. And um, I got very involved and in, um, in that ministry as a student and then joined staff with Campus Crusade in 1976 hmm. and uh, oh, 75. Um, and served for four years in the United States on um, two different campuses. And then um, most of the next 20 years uh, in Eastern Europe, um, both oh, wow. before, before and after the fall of communism. Okay. Got married in 1976 uh, to my one and only wife. And um, we have eight kids. Oh, wow. Oh, I didn't know you had that. Seven, great. seven of them born in Europe. So, um, and we now have 17 grandkids outside the womb and one uh, in the womb. Wow. So, but after, um, after the, or just before the fall of communism, I, um, I sensed that I, I was not a, I was the country director for our Campus Crusade Ministry in Czechoslovakia. And I had come to realize I'm really not a country director, ministry director person. And uh, so felt the need for a seminary and went, went to uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And uh, then in 19, uh, let's see, that was 1992, went back to England. We, we could never live in Czechoslovakia during the communist period. So I traveled in and out. And then... We went back to England where, it, where it, it had been a base for us. And um, I got a PhD. Um, I tell people prepositions are really important. Um, <laughs> I studied in Oxford, but my degree is not from Oxford. Okay. Uh, I studied at Wycliffe Hall, which is an Anglican college. And at the time they could supervise PhDs, but couldn't grant the degree. So mm -hmm. Coventry University in Coventry, England, was the degree granting university. 
but I never went there until the day I got my degree. So I did all my research at Oxford University. Oh, that's funny. Um, and then <clears throat> went st was still on staff with Campus Crusade, went back to Eastern Europe for five years on a, um, a theological team, helping to provide theological education for our Campus Crusade staff all over Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And, um, <clears throat> and then in, 19, in 2001, um, through, through a number of interactions, uh, ended up uh, coming to Answers in Genesis to uh, be a speaker, full-time speaker. So I've been, been here in Northern Kentucky since 2001. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, so you work, so you've been with Answers in Genesis uh, since 2001, you said? Yes. Okay. So what is, I'm sure some people are familiar uh, who may be watching, um, but just kind of flesh out what y'all do there at Answers in Genesis. Well, Answers in Genesis is a creation apologetics ministry that is seeking to proclaim the gospel and defend the truth of the Bible from the very first verse. So um, we don't just, we, we don't deal just with the creation evolution issue, but we're very focused on Genesis as the foundation to the trustworthiness of the whole rest of the Bible and uh, and the first 11 chapters foundational to the gospel. And so we don't wanna just see people believe in a creator uh, or even just to be a young earth uh, creationist. We want them to, to come to know Christ and to trust uh, God's word from beginning to end. That's good, that's good. Um, and I mean, there's been a lot going on with and you guys opened the museum in, was it 2007? Is that right? Yes. And then the ARC was when? 2016. 2016. Okay. So we, just, we just celebrated our fifth anniversary this summer. Yeah, that's good. Um, so I guess some of the misconceptions I'll hear, and of course we're from, we're from California and uh, there's a lot of, a lot of love for AIG out there. <laughs> Uh, as you know, I know you travel around a lot and have for a long time. Um, not everywhere, but there's some, it's funny enough in, here in, in because we're in Kentucky too, um, and even at seminary and going to Southern and stuff, I didn't get quite, uh, there wasn't as much universal uh, acceptance, I guess you could say. Not really rejection, like, oh, they're a bunch of heretics or this or that. But there definitely was a level of, well, OK, but, you know, they say you have to believe in a literal atom or a literal this or, you know, a young earth to be saved. Can you kind of flesh out some of the I'm sure you've heard even more. You know, what are some of the kind of misconceptions to kind of just put them on the table and, and, and deal with them uh, that you'll get at AIG or, or you've heard people tell you directly? Well, that that's certainly one. And um, the people who say that uh, are not listening or are not reading carefully because we have constantly over and over said, um, we're not saying that you have to believe in a young earth to be saved. What we say is you have to repent of your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. But what we say is, um, I, I like to put it this way, and I've, I've really worked on this uh, because I've helped to lead, a, a, we've done 14 trips down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. Oh, yeah, that's right. For, for theologians and other key Christian leaders. And we invite um, we invite people who disagree with us to come on the trip. Uh, young earthers, old earthers, people who are sitting on the fence. And so I've had to really uh, think through this to try to um, say things clearly. But um, I like to say that that the age of the earth is not a salvation issue, but it is a gospel coherency issue. Oh, um, that's good. Because um, you, you don't have to believe in literal days to be saved. Uh, there are lots of people who don't believe in the literal days, who I am absolutely certain have gone to heaven or will go to heaven. Um, but Genesis is foundational to the gospel. You, you have to have... 
uh, a literal Adam and a literal fall, or Jesus died for a mythological problem. Mm. Um, and the, the whole idea of evolution in millions of years really undermines the Bible's um, big picture or meta narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration or new heavens and earth. Um, and once you insert millions of years of death and disease and suffering and creatures going extinct and natural disasters and, and uh, all of that, which is part of the evolution story, it really undermines um, the, the Bible's message of salvation. So somebody can, can, um, can believe in the millions of years um, and still be saved, really trusting in Christ as their savior, but they're, they're undermining their own foundation mm. for, for that belief is my, our conviction. Yeah. So that's why we think it's important. That's good. Yeah, I've talked to a few. Um, you might have, I think it was Adam Howell and uh, Ryan Haley. I'm friends with both of those guys. They're about my age, PhDs from Southern. Uh, and I know, I think Ryan went on the trip Yes, four or five years ago, something like that. Uh, and I know Adam has as well. So I think Mark Coppinger also has. Is that correct? Yes, he was on the first trip, I believe. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah, he's one He's one of my favorites. We've known each other a while. He was, I took my very first class with him and love love him love him yeah um no that's good i appreciate i appreciate that i mean that's that's something i i mean i'll run into as well and that's part of my own testimony of you know learning about lucy and the missing links and this and that and the ice age and i mean i remember even in sixth grade drawing a chart of of you know the history of whatever and this is just standard public school in the 90s and uh i can only imagine i know they're what they're learning now it's even worse but um yeah, it was like, one of, well, well, where do Adam and Eve fit in, though? You know, I always kind of had that question, and I'm thankful that uh, a number of years ago, I forget how I got turned on to Answers in Genesis. I think it was maybe just through church directly. And I know Jenny, my my then-to-be wife, uh, had given me some apologetics CDs as well. And um, yeah, it's it's amazing how fast, once you're open, uh, and if you're really if you're really a believer and you're really just like, well, what does God's word say? And not, well, yeah. And there's always kind of this underlying, um, well, the world says this though, it seems, you know, and the world, well, you know, but science and it's like, well, science also says you can't rise from the dead. Science also says you can't make fish and bread from literally nothing. Right. I mean, so there's a bunch of other things that science doesn't say yet. Christians are like, oh yeah, totally. That's fine. You know, but other stuff, it's like, well, I don't know. God created in six literal days. That's a little funky. So, um, yeah, it's, you want to be consistent. At least that's always been my argument. Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> let's see here. What would you say, where would you say the church is as a whole, both just kind of in North America and even, even the globe, as far as, as far as this issue, are we, are we kind of on the, I mean, I know, I know we've got a lot of the, uh, critical theory and woke ideology. And that's really seemingly pressing the church. And again, I would argue people did that with materialistic evolution and trying to marry that with the scripture. Uh, so we've done this before. Um, so I, I, this issue isn't as loud as it has in the past, at least in my estimation, but would you say that are there places, you know, is Canada or, or, or South Korea or, you know, South Africa or someplace like that, are these places, do you know of that are growing in acceptance and and full literal historic belief in Genesis and a literal Adam and Eve and so on, or is stuff declining? I would assume it's declining here in America, uh, but I was just curious what your thoughts are on this. Well, I, I've had the privilege of speaking on this issue in thirty five countries, and um, I would say definitely America has the most uh, in terms of percentage in the church as the most young earth creationists. No, no question about that. Mm. Um, the, the importance of Genesis is growing in, in many countries in, in the church, um, but it's still a minority view very much in England and Germany, uh, almost unheard of in the church in France. Uh, and uh, 
More, more would believe Genesis in Eastern Europe and the former communist Eastern Europe and Soviet Union just because, well, I think because under communism, um, there was a reason why people believed God's word. It cost them to believe God's word. Yeah. Uh, but still, even there, there's, there's been a lot of compromise with at least the millions of years, um, probably not so much with evolution. Um, I've spoken in Egypt and in Jordan, uh, so it's in the Middle East. Um, Muslims, of course, believe in God, but the a lot of the Muslim uh, professors got their education in the West, so they might be anti-evolution, but they've they've accepted the millions of years, mm. and that that's permeated the church. Yeah, um, and and the American. Uh, the American church that that is theistic evolutionist or old earth creationist has had a, a big impact on the on the church and the rest of the world. And so um, I've got a colleague who's the head of our ministry all over Latin America. He's based in Mexico. And um, there's a tremendous hunger in in Latin America for the teaching on creation but there's there's a lot of false ideas that have been and are coming into the church um, to to compromise with evolution and and millions of years. So, wow. um, I would say from from my perspective, uh, I've been involved in the Evangelical Theological Society actively for twenty years. I would say that among lay people, uh, uh, lay people and, and students, there, there's been a, a growth over the last 50 years of young earth creationism in the church. And I think many pastors are, are seeing the, the truth. But I would say at the same time, there's been more and more compromise in the theological academic, academia mm. um, that not only are our old earthers accept our, our, our uh, seminary and Christian college professors accepting the millions of years, but there's increasing acceptance of theistic evolution, even doubting uh, the existence of a historical literal atom. Yeah. Um, and so there was a book published in 2017, Theistic Evolution, a scientific, uh, philosophical, and theological uh, critique. It's a thousand pages, uh, 25 authors, and uh, some of the editors had a presentation at the Evangelical Theological Society, and the, the room was packed. Yeah. And three of, the, three of the old earth creationist organizations have, uh, have had a booth in the exhibitors hall at, at the Evangelical Theological Society annual meeting. Uh, for a number of years, and AIG has had a booth there. We've been the only young Earth group there, so yeah. there's there's tremendous pressure um, within the theological world to accept evolution in millions of years, and um, that's a that's a great concern. Yeah, what would you say then? Uh, why 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 do people want to do that? I mean, it, there's a lot of people that think. What's the point? Why would you want to do that? Just the Bible says the six days. Look at Exodus 20. It's reaffirming God created in six days. There's a bunch of other places. Evolution's nowhere to be found, even hinted at in the scripture at all. Uh, why do people want to accept this so much? Well, I think uh, I think there's two reasons. One is that, and they both come out of the Enlightenment, um, but the Enlightenment in the uh, 17th, 18th century raised human reason to the place of supreme authority in people's minds over the church and over scripture. Mm. And, and uh, science became the queen of knowledge and scientists became the priests, the new priests of culture. And that really took off in the, in the 19th century, early 19th, late 18th and early 19th century. Uh, when the science, you, you had the industrial revolution, people were getting really excited about, how science could eradicate disease and and produce technology that would raise the standard of living for everybody and um, and that was the time when um, as a as a result of rejecting the scriptures there was a rejection of the biblical 
account of creation and, and biblical chronology. And that started in geology. And that's what I focused on in my, my own PhD research um, was how that millions of years idea developed before Darwin, over 50 years before Darwin. And so the church quickly compromised with that idea of millions of years in the early 19th century. Then Darwin came along and the church started to compromise with evolution. And, um, and you had at the same time, kind of like a one-two punch, you had the development of liberal theology, which was questioning the mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch, the, uh, the authorship of the book of Isaiah, um, uh, the rejection of miracles, um, the rejection of inspiration and the inerrancy of scripture. All of that was hammering the church. And then science is hammering on this question of origins. Mm -hmm. And then we're, we're today, uh, we've got 200 years of compromise in the church. And in one of my uh, lectures, I, I look at the 19th century and then I bring it up to the present. And I I quote some of the leading um, men of God in the church who were compromised on the millions of years. Um, Charles Spurgeon, C.I. Schofield, B.B. Warfield, and you can just go down the list. And so modern theologians are looking at those great champions of the, of the faith, orthodox men, men who believed in the inerrancy of Scripture, and they didn't think the age of the earth was important. Yeah. And then the majority of scientists, the vast majority of scientists say young earth creationism is pseudoscience, it's deceptive. And I've had, I've had uh, one, of my, one of my favorite uh, professors in seminary say, you know, Terry, I'm, I'm not going to read that creationist literature because I'm not, uh, I'm not trained in science. I'm not academically qualified to, to really evaluate um, what they're saying. And my response is, well, then you shouldn't believe anything that the evolutionists say, because you're not academically qualified to evaluate their arguments either. Yeah. But that really is a, is a false answer, because this particular person has a PhD. Uh, he's, he's written many books. He's very smart. And he does have the, the intellectual capacity to weigh evidence, to listen to both sides. And as a theologian, he has the word of God, which he affirms is the inerrant scriptures. And there's no excuse for him not carefully dealing with the biblical side yeah. of the question. So it's, it's the authority of science in the culture, and it's 200 years of compromise in the church. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's that's... Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. Um, can you flesh out a little bit for, because I'm sure some, a, lot, a lot of people are probably familiar, but a lot of people aren't. Um, so you mentioned theistic evolution, and yeah. you also mentioned old earth. So yeah. there's two different, to me, those are two distinct different things. I'm, I'm, I would say that's probably more or less accurate, right? Well, um, yes. Actually, I would say, that um, evolution is a three-part theory to explain all of reality. So you have biological evolution to explain the origin of living things, including man. Um, and you could include in that chemical evolution how the first uh, living cell popped into existence by time and chance and the laws of nature. But yeah, <clears throat> so you've got you've got the origin of life, uh, plants, animals, people, microbes. Uh, then you've got geological evolution, which is the origin of the Earth um, from a gas cloud around the sun that, uh, that, that formed a hot molten ball and eventually cooled and developed a crust and evolved an atmosphere. And over millions of years, you have the buildup of the layers and the fossils. Um, and then you've got cosmological evolution, which is the story to explain the origin of stars and galaxies and planets and solar systems. And all of it is based on the assumption that we can explain it all by time plus chance plus the laws of nature, the laws of physics and chemistry. So it's, it's a full-blown story to, to explain 
uh, the universe. And, mm. uh, and they even talk about the evolution of culture and the evolution of religion. So it's all uh, one grand story uh, based on the assumptions of uh, the philosophy of naturalism or atheism. Mm. Uh, not everybody is an atheist, but atheism is controlling science today. So um, theistic evolutionists believe the whole story, the Big Bang, the billions of years, stellar evolution, the evolution of the solar system from a gas cloud, the center of it became the sun, then the cloud flattened out, became rings, those rings evolved into the planets, uh, and eventually uh, we have the earth that we live on today with rock layers and fossils and millions of dead things and and all the diverse plants and animals and people. And so um, they believe that either God was uh, somehow behind the scenes controlling all of that time, chance, and the laws of nature in a way that is undetectable to scientists, mm. or he front-loaded that little cosmic egg that became the Big Bang, and he, he put into it all of the ingredients, parameters, whatever you want to say, that would guarantee that time and chance and the laws of nature would produce the universe that we live in today. So um, I would say then, in, except for believing that God is behind it all somehow, uh, theistic evolutionists are three-thirds evolutionists mm. because they accept cosmological, geological, and biological evolution, including human evolution. Um, but then there are a variety of old earth views that reject biological evolution and reject human evolution, but they accept the millions of years of geological evolution and cosmological evolution. They accept the Big Bang. They just don't accept the part about Darwin and that we're related to apes, which are related to microbes and um and they don't believe that all the plants and animals are related to a, a single common ancestor. So then they, they have to come up with various ways of God um, supernaturally stepping into the process over the course of millions of years to supernaturally create new forms of life and, uh, and maybe supernaturally create Adam's body or, or maybe Adam completely. Um, so that there's a lot of different uh, old earth views, but really theistic evolution is an old earth view too. Yeah. It's, it's just that the old earthers reject the, the biological part of evolution. Gotcha. Gotcha. Does that make sense? No. Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I know there's a lot of confusion um, for many who kind of either see it as, oh, it's, I just, yeah, it's no big deal. Just trust in Jesus. I, I had a good friend same way. Uh, and we had a number of conversations and he had the same type of assumption about, well, yeah, but Ken Ham just says you got to believe in, you know, a literal atom and, or a literal Genesis, a young earth to be saved. And it's like, no, no, never heard him say that. Yeah. <laughs> and I listened to quite a few things and read quite a few things as well. You know, uh, you know, one other thing, just to comment on that comment. Um, this is not Ken Ham's idea. Uh, he happens to be arguably the most well-known young earth creationist, but there are millions and millions of people, uh, Christians, who believe in a young earth, and uh, they have PhDs in, in theology and the Bible and science, and, and there were many young earth creationists before Ken Ham ever got involved in this. So yeah. it's, it's, it's not, it's, that's another... Um, it's another uh, characterization, a, a misrepresentation of reality, that this is not Ken Ham's view. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, this is, and be, before the 19th century, young earth creation was the orthodox Christian view. Um, even somebody like Davis Young, who's an old earther, theistic evolutionist, uh, uh, professor Emeritus of Geology at Calvin College says for the first 18 centuries, um, young earth creationism was the view of the church. So, uh, wow. yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's, it, but it, that, I appreciate you laying out the kind of historical, because that's, that's a thing that a lot of people 
don't really understand. That's why, I mean, I love history, church history, American history, just in general, because you not only are getting ideas, but those ideas, as the phrase goes, ideas have consequences. And whether those consequences are good or bad or you know, somewhere in between, but people find themselves, I mean, I have a deep interest in Spurgeon. I, ho I hope to do some further work on him, but I know, you know, he's in the midst of the Baptist union and all you needed to do being the Baptist union was to believe in believers baptism. That was it. So there was all sorts of craziness, universalists and Unitarians and everything else. And it's like, I can't, I can't, we can't even police ourselves because, you know, talk about the SBC or something and the corruption going on there. This, at least we've got the, you know, I'm being in the SBC, we've got the Southern Baptist, you know, uh, Baptist Faith and Message 2000. And there's all sorts of other documents and, and things, but they just had <laughs> believe in believers baptism. It's like, okay. But he finally left and that caused a ruckus. And, you know, he had a lot of doubts with, I know Darwin, but like you said, um, I don't know if he ever really changed from believing in uh, or allowing for millions of years, but it's astonishing because it's, that's, that's also the air he he's breathing. It's hard to be like, well, how can everybody else be wrong about this? And I'm right. It's just like, well, you know, the minor minority, but often history tells the minority is actually the one who is right. <laughs> yeah. Always, a lot of times. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's some, and those who are watching again, I mean, I love passages, of course, Genesis and, and many others, but you know, even something like Colossians 1, 15 is such, I mean, that's a lot of people say that's like a hymn, like the Christ hymn. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You know, I mean, just that alone, you know, people get hung up, well, firstborn and Jehovah Witnesses go off the rails and whatever. But, you know, firstborn of all creation, not of materialism or processes or, I mean, God could have used all these terms. He could have clearly said that the earth was created. I might hear my kids in the background. Sorry. Um, he could have used, I mean, he explains to uh, Abraham, you know, with the stars, as many as the sand of the sea. If the earth or the cosmos was ancient, it was billions of years old. He could have said that. He could have plopped Abraham down 4,000 years ago and said, well, you know, it's been 5 billion years and I've been doing this and this and this. He could have said that. There's yep. no hint of that at all. And so, I mean, that's just, again, biblically alone to say, okay, there's zero here, nothing. And then there's all this other stuff of, oh yeah, God created, God created, special creation, special creation, special creation. And then it's like, and it takes it one step further. If you want to think about it, well, yeah, but God could. And it's like, you're, you're denying God's power. I mean, there's no other way around that. You're denying not only his, not only his power, but also his character, uh, especially when he says I created, or he's creating, you know, fish and bread from nothing or making blind men see and, and lame men walk and so on. Um, I, uh, I wrote an article, just a short article on our website. Uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Um, if God, I can't remember the title exactly, but if God created over millions of years, I argue he had lots of ways in, in Hebrew, in simple language to say that. And, uh, and so I discussed some of the ways he could have said. So, for, for example, um, Scripture talks about um, thousands upon thousands or myriads upon myriad. You know, he could have said after thousands and thousands of days or after thousands and thousands of years. There's, there's lots of ways he could have said that. And then I, and then I say, um, if God did uh, create that way, then Genesis 1 is the most incompetent communication, or it's deceptive. I mean, he couldn't have said it more the wrong way, yeah. using, using the Hebrew word yom and numbering the days. And, um, and so then God becomes, it's not just an issue of his power, but his uh, his intelligence and his ability to communicate, and he's the one who invented language. Yeah, so he becomes the most incompetent communicator, or worse, a deceiver. And yeah. it's it, it's a huge problem. This age of the earth issue, I believe, is an assault on the character of God, mm. and uh, people don't see it. Yeah, no, that I mean that's 
Yeah, it's kind of once you start peeling back the layers a little bit, because I think I think a lot of folks, at least, you know, at the lay level and, you know, I ran into this at seminary, too, um, that, you know, they just they just don't think it's connected. You know, they want to dwell on soteriology or they want to look at, you know, parse out all of the, you know, 17th century theology of this guy or, you know, look at the languages and all that's good. But so often it seems that people are like, well, that's already settled. You know, it's settled science, which is especially in the last year and a half we're realizing is, I mean, for lack of a better word, it's a lie. I mean, there's, if science is never settled, not real science, you know, observing and repeating and examining and pushing back. I mean, just look at the response to some, you know, in the mainstream media about, you know, somebody uh, having tested positive and getting sick and then all of a sudden, they're better and, and they get mad about it. And are, are they question? Well, you can't question the masks. And it's like, well, you could a year ago and now it's settled science and just it's, it's fiction. I mean, it really is, it's unbelievable. And I, I don't see any difference in one sense with worldview and how, you know, academia is, is doing what it's doing as well. You know, I found though in, in my reading and in my interaction with people who reject young earth creation uh, and I'm, I, I've had interacted with a lot of people who are seminary trained PhDs, and I have found in my reading and my personal interactions that most of them have never carefully examined Genesis, mm. have never have never carefully, if at all, read the best creationist biblical and scientific literature. So they're rejecting something. Uh, without ever having investigated it. Mm. And, uh, I, I remember when I was in seminary, we had a guest lecture from, from Dallas Seminary. Um, and uh, I was walking back to my car at the end of the day, and he was, he was going to his rental car. And uh, I said, you know, I, I enjoyed your lecture today. It was on the Psalms or something. And I uh, just wondered if I could ask you a couple questions. And uh, I said, um, the days of creation were those literal or long ages or what do you what do you think? And I'll never forget the conversation. This PhD in Old Testament, he said, uh, "Well, I've never studied the issue, but I, I I don't see a problem with taking them as figurative of long ages." I said, "Okay, um, what about Noah's flood? Was that global or local flood in the Middle East?" Or and he said, well, uh, again, I haven't studied the issue, but I don't see a problem with taking it as a local flood. So here you have a, a Ph.D. in Old Testament, and he hasn't studied the first 11 chapters of Genesis carefully and, and this issue of origins. And I found that is widespread. Wow. So it's not just that they've studied the creationist arguments and they find them uh, unconvincing. It's that they've been, I, I use the language, um, they've been brainwashed into thinking that science has proven this. No real credible scientist believes in young earth. Of course, they have never read the writings of real scientists who believe in a young earth. Yeah. And, and therefore, they're not going to investigate it. Wow. And they're yeah. not even going to consider, I mean, I've tried to interact with some uh, some leading theologians at, at uh, the annual meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society uh, to, to sit down with them and talk about why this issue matters. Not, not get into the science, not get into the Hebrew, but just theologically, biblically, why does this matter? And I haven't even been able to get them to sit down and discuss that. Yeah. Well, you have a captive audience now. And so I know I know we're just over half an hour now, but why don't you just flesh? I mean, I, you've touched on it some, but why is it someone who said if they're saying, well, I just I don't know, Dr. Mortensen, I just I mean, yeah, I appreciate answering Genesis. The arc looks really cool. Hope I can be there sometime. Maybe dinosaurs were, eh, I don't know, Leviathan and, eh, you know, but they're still kind of wishy washy because they haven't, like you said, studied it. And but they also just don't want to look like a weirdo. They don't want to lose their whatever. Um, why is this such an important issue? Well, I would say one of the most important issues that I've found people have not thought about, including most theologians, is 
the issue of millions of years of death before the fall. Uh, mm -hmm. Most people don't really understand that, that, that the millions of years is not empty time. The evolutionists say things happened in those millions of years. Uh, stars exploded, asteroids slammed into the earth. Uh, and from the beginning of, of life, which they say was about three and a half billion years ago with the first single celled creature, there's been millions and millions of years of death and disease and suffering and natural disasters in the creation, creatures going extinct. The evolutionists say there are, um, in the fossil record, they see evidence of five major mass extinction events mm. when anywhere from 60 to 90% of all the species living at the time of those events or short periods of time uh, went extinct. So you have massive death. The fossil record is a record of death. Uh, there, there are dinosaur bones that have cancer, evidence of cancer, arthritis, brain tumors. There are thorns and thistles in the rock record that evolutionists say are three to 400 million years old. Mm -hmm. If those, and, and those dinosaur bones, they say are at least 65 million years old before humans ever came into existence. So then you have to put all of that death and disease and suffering into Genesis 1 and a time period that God called very good. Wow. What kind of a God would call all of that very good? And if he is powerful, why would he create in a process like that where he's continually either uh, causing or allowing to happen uh, massive natural disasters that are wiping out creatures that he made, and then he makes more creatures that are very similar to the ones that went extinct. What kind of a God is this? Yeah. Um, but Genesis 3 describes not just spiritual death. Adam and Eve did die spiritually. They hid themselves from God, but that was before God pronounced judgment. He, he cursed the animals. He cursed the serpent which was a physical judgment. He cursed the animals. He cursed the ground. Uh, he said, thorns and thistles, the ground shall grow for you. And he's not talking about the ground in the Garden of Eden because they were expelled from the garden. He's talking about the ground outside the garden. Yeah. So Genesis clearly says thorns and thistles came after Adam sinned, not for billions of years before Adam. Um, and so... The, the fall is critical to the question of the age of the earth. And I've found most Christians have never thought about that. And as I've lectured um, in churches, and that's always a major point I hit on, it's like the light bulbs come on. They see, wow, this is foundational to the gospel. Jesus did not come into the world and die on the cross and rise from the dead to to fix a, a bad creation that he had kind of messed up. And he's not coming again to, to create a new heavens and earth because the first creation uh, just didn't work out quite the way he, he wanted. Um, he's coming back and Jesus died and rose again because of the fall, because man rebelled and God judged. Mm. And then the, the flood, um, it's not more important than the cross, but the flood has three whole chapters describing it. <laughs> and uh, there's no other event in the Bible that has that much description. And it's describing, it's describing a global year-long catastrophic flood. It is not describing a local flood in the Middle East. Um, and uh, I recently wrote an article on our website just just on the biblical, 20 biblical reasons for concluding that it was a historical global catastrophe. And I have found again that most old earth creationists either completely ignore Noah's flood, it's not even on the radar, or they believe it was a myth or uh, a local flood in the Middle East. Wow. And you just can't get a local flood out of Genesis 6 to 8. So, yeah, I mean 
and it explains the 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 dead things, right? I mean, that's something that I'll I'll find in conversations with people. It's well, I'm not really sure about the recent creation and this and that and the ages, the the days. I think that might be ages. And then they go a little further and say, well, you know, I mean, classic example like a Hugh Ross or somebody like that or BioLogos, where they reject the you know direct interpretation, literal interpretation of Genesis one, and then they go to Genesis six through nine, and they're like, yeah, it's probably not really that. And it's like. Well, you've dismantled reality because like you said, there's millions of dead things buried in rock layers all over the earth. I know that's that's one thing that you all say sometimes. And even what is it, uh, Buddy, what is it, Davis, the, the yes. singer guy? He's got the song and everything. But uh, I know Ken Ham said that a lot too. But but that's true. Like, And that's and that's the thing that, I mean, that's, I've heard re- references, their Bible, the geologic column is their Bible. This is, well, there's this and then this age and, then you have the index fossil. Well, how do you know how old the index fossil is? Well, it's based, you know, it's based on what layer it's found. How 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 do you know how old the layer is? Well, based on the index fossil. And it's like yeah. it's literally circular reasoning. Like, well, this is 65 million years old because we found it in this layer. And the layer is 65 million years old because we found this fossil that we said that, and it's like, wait, hold on. Are you serious? Like, and that's it. I mean, there's no like it's a shell game. I've often kind of I know a lot of other people use that too. And they just there's no real answers under. There's no nut under the under the yep. under the shells. Yeah. Um, Romans and, five shared with people too. Same thing. And, and let me add one thing. Yep. People think radiometric dating is what proves the millions of years, but this is where history is so important. The millions of years was locked into the minds of geologists in the early 19th century, a hundred years before they discovered radioactive isotopes. Oh wow. So by the end of the 19th century, the consensus was that the Earth was at least 300 million years old. And it was radiometric dating that was developed in the early uh, 20th century that expanded the age of the Earth over about four decades. It, It grew and grew until we got to about four and a half billion years, which is approximately what they say today that yeah. that became the settled view in the 1940s but the radiometric dating method is based on the same naturalistic assumptions that were embedded in geology in the early 19th century mm. so the assumptions are critical and what people don't understand is that nobody goes out and looks at rocks and fossils or looks through the microscope at DNA with an empty mind. Everybody has a worldview, and that worldview affects what they see and how they interpret what they see as they try to reconstruct the past history of life or the earth or the solar system or the universe. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's, and that's the thing that I, I appreciate a lot. I mean, being supporters for a number of years of Answers in Genesis and, and other like-minded ministries um is is that and even just there's others that haven't necessarily talked about the creation issue or a literal uh, genesis but worldview worldview i mean it, it matters so much and i know that's more popular than it used to be as far as people understanding that and even in the world you'll see uh people's philosophy people's worldview i've seen that in secular and quote-unquote regular literature where they're talking about a worldview it's like yeah, because nobody's. I mean, that's what the joke is. It's you know, oh, that's biased. It's like, well, so are you. <laughs> like everybody's yeah. biased. I mean, quit quit thinking that you have you know that CNN or Fox or somebody like that is neutral or they're they're or we're just trying to figure out the facts. No, you're not. Especially if you have a massive worldview of you know two centuries worth and your tenure and your reputation on the line, you're you're going to toe the line hands down. You're not gonna you're not gonna kick against it even if there's abundant evidence uh, to the contrary. So, yeah. Peer pressure pressure is really, really powerful. And (laughs) we saw it, we saw it in the new Testament, you know, uh, Nicodemus and, and others, they, they were secret believers of Jesus because they didn't want to get cast out of the Sanhedrin. Yeah. And um, the peer pressure is powerful. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I was just thinking this, then we can kind of wrap up with maybe use some suggestions of uh, literature and resources you could suggest. But um, again, for those watching and something that I, I find very convincing for 
you know, a direct, actual, literal, historical Adam, uh, which then ties with the rest of Genesis, which ties then with a global flood, which ties with, I mean, I would say, again, it's, it's a kind of a chain. It's all like a rope all bound together. But Romans 5, among many others, but Romans 5 is probably one of the most concise in verse, like, say, 12 says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam till Moses, even over those sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was the type of the one who was to come. And then, I mean, it just goes, I mean, it mentions Jesus and Moses and Adam. And it's like, well, you know, two of those guys are real, but one of them is not, right? Or maybe Jesus was real, but we're not sure about Moses even. I mean, how, you don't, we don't read regular, quote unquote, regular literature like that. We don't read an email and think, well, you know, Dr. Morton said he, he mentioned his wife, but, he, 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 you know, I've never met her. She probably doesn't exist. Like, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. But we do this with the Bible, uh, even Christians who are trying to be well-meaning. But the therefore in 12, verse 12 is right before that. He's talking about sin. He's talking about weak. Verse 6, for while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Well, did he or not? And how are they ungodly? Where did that sin come from? Where did the, all these things? I mean, there's this logical progression. Mm -hmm. And it's just Romans 5 is, is worth a study for especially those listening. If you're if you're on the fence, read and study Romans five, and then and branch out from there. And I think it's yeah. unless you would say something different, but no, I, I would agree. The only thing I would say is um, Romans five twelve does not uh, deal with the question of animal death before the fall, because in context it's just talking about human death. And yeah. so for that, I go three chapters farther to Romans eight, where Paul says that the whole creation is groaning in bondage to corruption. And uh, in the history of the church, the, the almost universal belief uh, has been that Romans 8 is referring to what happened in, Roman, in Genesis 3. That's when the creation was put in bondage to corruption. And uh, Romans 8 says that one day the creation will be liberated when uh, Christians receive their resurrection body. And so... The, the liberation of the creation is connected to the redemptive work of Christ because the, the, the bondage of the creation was related to the sin of the first Adam. And so once you accept the millions of years, you've really broken that whole connection. And Jesus ends up uh, dying and, and rising again and, and coming again to fix his own bad creation. Mm. instead of coming to satisfy his his holy justice in in judgment of man because of sin and redeeming the whole creation which is what Romans 1 is or uh, uh, Colossians 1 as you uh, cited verse 15 but then you read on you know he's he's before all things he holds all things together and then verse 20 says um, that by him all things were redeemed whether things on earth or things in heaven. And so yeah. his redemptive work is, is finished in terms of our own personal salvation, but his redemptive work is not finished in terms of the whole creation. He's still going to uh, restore and redeem the whole creation. Yeah. I mean, it, it, for me, I mean, again, it was, it, it just, it logically makes so much more sense. <laughs> and, yeah. and reality and then in the scripture and it's then easy to say well these things are messed up but there's curses or there's diseases and famines and people die and all this stuff why are you upset about that well because we have this innate you know god-given knowledge but then there's also all these other things that go along with that i i just feel like you have to be so much more uh you know like a gymnast just kind of flipping around and doing certain things and try well you know and you just and that's why I feel like with some of the the new critical theory and the woke ideology and all that other stuff that people they're talking about these extra things that aren't in the gospel at all. And God's making distinctions when he doesn't make distinctions and on and on and on. It's like, what are you supposed to tell somebody who's really struggling with sin or struggling just with reality and they don't know Christ? What really can you tell them if you're believing in, you know, X, Y, Z ideology that's not biblical? You know, yeah. you might think it fits or you might think, well, I've got liberty in Christ, but 
yeah, it's 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 easier just to try and be as consistent as possible because then you don't have to flip around and do all this extra stuff. Um, and what? you know, just add one more thing about consistency. I would argue you cannot with any uh, exegetical consistency. In other words, with with a uh, a consistency in how you handle the word of God. You cannot argue against the LGBTQ revolution and argue against abortion, mm. but at the same time, um, deny a literal Adam, a literal fall, uh, because Genesis is foundational to those moral issues. Um, right. And, and you can't, you can't, uh, you can't, argue against uh, homosexuality and abortion and insist on a literal Adam and literal fall, but deny literal days of creation or the global flood because uh, careful Bible study that gets you to abortion is wrong. Homosexuality is wrong. Um, there's only one race. Mm -hmm. The same, the same way of treating scripture is, is going to lead you to the flood was global. The days of creation were literal and those genealogies in Genesis 5 and 11, which are the only genealogies in the Bible and in all of ancient Near Eastern literature that has chronological information that says this man lived this many years and then this man was born, that, that is what gives us the, the idea that the creation is only a little more than 6,000 years old. You, you can't interpret some things literal and some things figurative not with any consistent principles of interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, well, I guess just to wrap up here, um, what would you, what would you suggest as far as to someone? I mean, of course, Answers in Genesis has a very robust website with lots of content. Um, what would you say to someone and say, you know what, start here, you know, read this, go here, do this. Give me some, uh, give us some, some suggestions there. Well, uh, first of all, I would I would highly recommend um, my lecture, Millions of Years, Where Did the Idea Come From? Mm -hmm. You can watch it on our website for free, uh, or it's also on our Answers.TV streaming service. And I, I recommend it not because I gave the lecture, but because of the historical truth that is revealed there. Mm -hmm. The millions of years did not come from rocks and fossils. It didn't come from people just going out and looking at the world with an empty mind and saying, we're just going to let the facts speak for themselves. Um, and the lecture also shows how the church's compromise in the early 19th century, how that has played out uh, mm -hmm. up to the present. So that's, that's an important uh, presentation. Um, I would say the, the New Answers book, Volume 1, answers the 27 most asked questions. What about dinosaurs? Where did Cain get his wife? What about carbon dating? What about the other dating methods? Were the days of Genesis literal? Was the flood global? Uh, where did the so-called races? There's only one race of humans, but how do we explain the diversity of shades of brown skin color and, and other superficial differences among people today? Um, so those are really, and as I've traveled and spoken in 35 countries, those are the same questions that come up every country I've been in. Wow. So they're the ones uh, that people need to answer. For more in-depth uh, consideration of this issue, especially the age of the earth, um, I did a, uh, a lecture. Again, these are uh, DVDs, and I think they're also on our Answers TV um, I did a talk, Intelligent Design versus the Intelligent Design Movement. Mm. And I talk about the fact that in, intelligent design arguments are perfectly biblical. They're consistent with Romans 1 and Psalm 19, that, that God reveals himself through creation. Um, but the intelligent design movement is, there are a few young earthers who are involved, but the age of the earth isn't very important to them. And the, the ID movement uh, centered in the Discovery Institute based in Seattle. Um, they are almost all old earthers and say the age of the earth doesn't matter. And they're only fighting Darwinism. Huh. And so I explain, I give four strengths of the ID movement and then four weaknesses that I think are, are fatal um, to that 
strategy. I also have a lecture on ape men, the grand illusion, and how we're being deceived. And I show what the evolutionists, how they're using art and imagination to deceive us. And, and then I show biblically, it is impossible to harmonize human evolution with uh, the biblical account of human origins. Mm. Uh, so, and then in terms of, if, if you have people that are seminary trained or people that want to dig deeper, Coming to Grips with Genesis is a book that I co-edited and contributed to with 13 other scholars, most of them seminary professors, defending the young earth view biblically and historically. We don't get into the science, mm -hmm. but um, I, I designed that book to be able to be used in seminary, but I worked with the authors really hard uh, that, that their writings would be understandable to a thoughtful layperson who wants to dig deeper. So uh, I said, no Latin and all Hebrew and Greek uh, will be translated and transliterated yeah. for, for the reader. Um, and then the book Searching for Adam, which is uh, I edited and contributed to with 15 other experts in science, in theology, in Bible. In, uh, and, and so we defend the literal truth of Adam uh, biblically, theologically, historically, uh, paleontologically, genetically, anatomically, uh, morally. It, it's a full-blown defense mm. uh, by 16 authors. And again, an in-depth book, but written at a level that a thoughtful layperson can understand. So oh, that's good. Those well, are. That's good. I'll, I'll, I'll share all those links. I'll put them in the description there so people can check that out as well. Um, I, can I mention four yeah. articles? on our website that I've written that deals with the age of the earth in different ways. One, they can find all of these by typing my last name, Mortensen, with natural evil. And then they'll find an article, The Fall and the Problem of Millions of Years of Natural Evil. Mm. And it really unpacks what we've only been able to just touch on. Uh, then I did um, a paper at the Evangelical Theological Society a few years ago critiquing three of the leading systematic theology textbooks used in seminaries by Millard Erickson, Wayne Grudem, and uh, Gordon Lewis and Bruce Demarest at, at Denver Seminary. And so I, I critique their old earth views in those books that are being used to train the next wow. generation of pastors. So you can find that by my name and systematic theology. It'll be the first article. Um, I also did an article just recently I mentioned earlier this book, Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. Uh, 25 authors. It's, a, it's an excellent critique of theistic evolution, but most of the authors uh, I know either from just personally knowing them and interacting or from reading, most of them accept the millions of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the authors and editors of that book was uh, my former professor, who I love and appreciate in many ways, Dr. Wayne Grudem. And so I recently uh, wrote an, a lengthy article where I critique his two chapters in that book, Theistic Evolution. And I, I show that almost every argument, theological and biblical argument he has against theistic evolution are also reasons why he should reject the millions of years. Wow. And, and and yet he doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, that's an, an important. And then one final article, um, a book came out in 2016, which sadly Grudem and some other really influential uh, Christian scholars endorsed is called Grand Canyon Monument to an Ancient Earth. Mm. And it's, it's written by um, eight professing Christians and three non-Christians who are agnostics, which right away should alert people, there's something wrong uh, because 2 Corinthians 6 says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Um, and so I wrote a lengthy critique of the, the biblical, theological, philosophical, and historical parts of the book. I leave the geology to young earth creationist geologists, but it is a very deceptive book and uh, because it was published by an evangelical publisher, it was endorsed 
Hardly by Wayne Grudem and uh, several other really big name people in, in the theological world. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a seriously deceptive book mm. that's going to lead people astray. So if you type my name in the search engine and ancient earth, you will find uh, a link to my 2000 word summary article about my longer article, which is 50,000 words, mm. as I really go into showing what's wrong with that yes. book. So anyway, on the, on the age of the earth, those would be some helpful articles. Yeah, no, that's good. And I think, yeah, I would definitely encourage anybody to check that out because there isn't much to stand on. I mean, that's, that's what the, that's what the evolutionist has to stand on period, the secular guy. And then even the, you know, theistic evolution person who says God used evolution. And then even, and there's this halfway ground that oh, I reject evolution, but I'm still going to believe in millions and billions of years for some, for some reason. I don't, I don't, again, I don't want to, I want to be as consistent as possible. It sounds like you, I believe you do too. There, if there's good reason to believe in billions of years, great. But I don't see any good reasons, like both in the Bible and just in reality. I mean, science, quote unquote, itself has changed, like you said, multiple times. You know, the earth is is a million years. Now it's 100 million. Now it's 300 million. Now it's a billion. Now it's 4.6 billion. It's like, well, if it was wrong then, it's wrong now. And what's right today probably will be wrong tomorrow. Like, it's just, it's astounding that we just, we kind of hang our hats on things that are just floating there and don't have any actual foundation. But anyway, that could be a whole nother conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, again, I appreciate this um, so much. Thank you so much for just taking the time to, to talk and flesh out some of these issues, because like you said, it's not just theological, it's moral and it's stuff that deals with just reality, our everyday lives and how people operate and, um, yeah, I mean, we just we were we were at a a um, big what is it the not big Clifty the other one uh, Mammoth Cave here in Kentucky, and you know the ch our children have been to the museum a number of times Creation Museum and, and and the Ark as well and you know so they're used to and we've been to other things also, um, and you know, so they see the, the, the signs and the art and the this and that, you know, there is artistic license, even at the creation museum, but that's all has a worldview behind it. And so it was easy to, we were just there for my birthday about a month ago to articulate that, you know, there's a big map of the earth and it's this, and there's all, you know, the United States is covered in water and, you know, and I'm just talking like I'm talking right now. I'm like, see girls right here. This, this is just an idea of what they believe happened in the past based on materialism based on this and this and this and they're like oh well why would people believe that you know and just having really good discussions just out in the open so um you know we can't hide from those things shouldn't just you know be in a cave we need to at least understand them and say oh they're coming from that worldview got it now i'm going to address it accordingly and yeah. uh, move on from there so yeah no it's again it's been it's been a pleasure thank you Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Dr. Mortensen, uh, for just taking the time. And I'll put, like I said, all the descriptions and uh, hopefully people will check out that stuff and, and learn lots if they haven't already. So, okay. Yeah. Closing words at all. Well, um, I think we're seeing in, in our country, the fruit of um, decades of rejecting the authority of the word of God. Mm -hmm. it's certainly been rejected in the culture now in a massive way. But it's because the church has rejected the authority of Genesis, and uh, you you can't you can't convince un unbelieving people to believe the gospel when they're convinced, and they see the church being convinced that the early chapters of Genesis don't mean what they say, mm. um, and so the the total rejection of biblical morality comes from a rejection of the biblical history. Yeah. And uh, the church needs to, we need another reformation. Yeah. We need to come back to the authority of the word of God. Amen. So that's good. We need another reformation. Let's close with that. I appreciate that. Thanks so much, Terry. Uh, maybe we'll, maybe we'll talk again, hopefully. Okay. God bless. Right. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye.